Hello, Culinary Wine students and servers and restaurant managers. I'm Kirsten Fox, and welcome to another edition of Culinary Wine Questions. Today we are covering Zinfandel, what it's like, how to talk about it at your tables, how to differentiate it, it from other wines, uh, excuse me, red wines especially. Okay, so, but check this out. So in my wine school class, so I'm also headmistress of Fox School of Wine here in Park City. In our last wine class, we had two bottles that were sealed with these glass stoppers. And so as a sommelier, I automatically try to think about how to open this because um, you, you take the foil off, it's just a normal foil. You can see where we cut the normal foil. But um, part of being a sommelier, it's, it's called silent service. It's supposed to be quiet. And when you take this off, you can hear, this is what it looks like. Check that out. It's got a little tiny rubber rim that sits inside the bottle and snaps in to make it, I mean, you can put this in your refrigerator like this. It wouldn't, it would not, leak because it's got this kind of a rubber uh, little neck to it. But the service piece of it with this glass against glass is really hard. So I, I came up with just the idea that what I would do at a table is to, I would, I would hold the bottle as if it was going to be a screw cap. And I would actually, so the, the foil is cut as normal and I would just grab the glass stopper I would actually twist so that I can feel it loosen and then I would lift it off within my hand trying to control this little glass thing and not have it hit the side. So we'll see what happens. Maybe the Court of Master Psalms or someone will come out with actual protocol. But in the meantime, I would use this like a screw cap. I would twist it, lift, and pull it out that way to try to minimize any of this clinking on the side. So pretty cool. All right, so today on more on topic, we are going to be drinking a little bit of Zinfandel together. And I have poured a glass in my, um, while I talk to you today. And this is a glass of Zinfandel, but it's known as something else. So if you happen to be working in an Italian restaurant, Zinfandel in an Italian restaurant is called Primitivo. And Primitivo is the exact same as a Zinfandel. They're basically like very, very close kissing cousins. And so Primitivo is grown typically in the southern part of Italy. And it is a, a Zinfandel grape. And so if you see Primitivo, if you're in an Italian restaurant, and you see Primitivo, that is a Zinfandel grape. And what that means is now, Zinfandel itself is uh, grown in two major areas in the world. I'm just gonna take a quick sip, a little smell. I mean, this is like uh, cooked blackberries. It's got some earth in it. Um, but just really heavy on the berries. And then in your mouth, you get the berries, but it's not, um, this is not a very tannic wine. Most Zinfandel is not super tannic, which means tannin is that, that grippy compound in your mouth that red wines um, give you. You also get tannin if you ever bite into the skin of a walnut. It's got that grippy, almost, it's astringent. It actually kind of dries your mouth out. It also can taste bitter, depending on uh, the wine or the thing you're tasting. Sometimes if you've accidentally bitten into the, uh, the skin of a banana, that too has grippy, uh, and that's tannin. Also, black tea has tannin in it. So anyway. Um, Zinfandel is not known as a grape that offers tons of tannin. So let's talk a little bit about the two regions. It, it, because Zinfandel varies by region. It grows primarily in California and Italy. 
Um, oh, you know what I forgot to do? Let me show you what we're going to cover today, what you're going to get out of this. So I'm going to go to my other little screen here. And we are going to talk about what Zinfandel is, uh, what kind of style it is, and, and the age of Zinfandel. Where is it grown? How does that change things? How does the location change the style? How does it compare to other common reds? What does it pair with? And then really importantly, what should you avoid pairing it with? So this is what we're going to cover today. And you will walk away with that uh, at the end of the webinar. So let's talk about uh, Zinfandel. So style-wise, I already mentioned big berries. So it is a super fruit-forward wine. It's got a lot of dark berries and red berries. Almost like um, it's, they call it jammy in many um, descriptions because when you think about berries, there's a difference between smelling fresh blackberries, just cut blackberries, versus smelling blackberry jam. It's that cooked, kind of pruney, raisiny thing that goes on once you cook berries. So Zinfandel comes off and it comes away, you come away with a a, a jammy cooked fruit kind of experience. So then in your mouth, Zinfandel from those two regions, California and Italy. California Zinfandel gets extremely high in alcohol because the berries themselves get so ripe and they get so filled with sugar that the yeast that eat the sugar when, it, when the grape juice is sitting in the vat and they add the yeast, the yeast eat the sugar and the byproducts are carbon dioxide and alcohol. And because there's so much sugar for these yeast to eat, they actually produce high, high levels of alcohol. They actually have to use special yeast that can withstand a lot of high alcohol, like a kind of swimming around in high alcohol, which kills a lot of the um, less strong yeast. So we had in class the other night at Fox School of Wine, we had a Zinfandel that was 16.5% alcohol. I mean, when you swirled it, we've talked about legs on these webinars before, but when you swirled it, the you can see the uh, legs or tears of the glass coming down. You, it was almost like syrup in this 16.5% alcohol wine. And what that does is it adds, as you can see on the side of this glass, it adds viscosity in your mouth, which means it adds body or a thickness in your mouth. So California Zinfandels, although 16.5 was the highest I've ever seen, they can get up comfortably and often into the 15% range. They're common between 14 and 15%, which is high alcohol. Now this, since it's a Primitivo, also known as Zinfandel, but Primitivo from Italy, it's only 13.5% alcohol. So because it doesn't have the alcohol viscosity to it, it's not quite as mouth-filling as the California Zinfandels usually are. So we've got high berry, like cooked jam. We have got high alcohol from California, but a little bit lower in Italy. And then it also has kind of a, a briary or a brambly kind of aroma and taste like um, fresh basil leaves or um, what's another, I wrote down another, uh, Oh, a bay leaf or thyme, that kind of thing. It's kind of got that herbal characteristic, kind of like walking through undergrowth and that. So um, that is uh, the styles of Zinfandel. Now, you I'm sure you've seen Zinfandel labels that say old vines or ancient vines. And there's really no... Um, there's no law, there's, there's nothing that actually prescribes how, what that means, but Zinfandel plants, to their credit, they can produce grapes for over 100 years. The berries, uh, the, the vines that produce this uh, Cantelle Primitivo wine were over 40 years old. So it's, it, when they say ancient vines or old vines, it just means that the vines themselves 
are, themselves are probably older than normal, I guess I would say is kind of something that would be, you'd be able to say. And also old vines tend to produce less amount of fruit, but the berries that are produced are more concentrated. Kind of like as you age, you know, when we're adolescent, we go big, we big, everything's big and we're all crazy. And then as we age, we kind of start modifying our, our output and we start maybe doing things a little more, a little more smartly and a little less big. So that's kind of like the, the ancient vines. So that is uh, why you'll see old vines or ancient vines on Zinfandels, because that's unusual. Most vines are not over 100 years old. So let's see, these are usually oaked. Uh, they do that for two reasons. They get some nice vanilla in them and some, um, some other spice characteristics, but they also, oak adds tannin, that, that grippy compound, and since this is a low tannin, uh, type of red wine, they want to add a little more of that grippy compound because that goes with some of the bigger, richer foods that we want to pair a big wine like this with. So uh, that is the reason, one of the reasons they oak it. So let's see, compare, let's compare this to the other wines on, a, on your wine list. So if we look at the lighter wines on a list, say a Pinot Noir, um, this is going to have more bigger, uh, riper fruit characteristics in your mouth. So where a Pinot will typically have more of a cranberry kind of a, a presence in your mouth, this is going more to the boysenberries and that. So that riper fruit. Then also if it's a California Zinfandel, which we're mostly drinking here in the US, if it's a California Zin, it's gonna have some high alcohol, which increases that viscosity in your mouth. And most Pinots aren't ever more than 14%. So you can imagine it's light, they're lighter in your mouth. The higher alcohol will get this to be more, um, more mouth filling. So when you're up, um, when you're doing California Zin, it's gonna be much, richer and thicker in your mouth than a Pinot. Then versus say a Merlot, um, this is going to have more of those cooked fruits, fruit cook, cooked fruit characteristics instead of the ripe but just fresh fruit that you would smell off of Merlot. Also, it's going to probably be a little lighter in tannin than a Merlot. And then with a Cab, a Cabernet Sauvignon, or just a Cabernet, um, this is going to be probably uh, as mouth filling. I mean, cabs tend to be really mouth filling because they do have a lot of those dark berries, but this is not going to have uh, the tannin, that, that grippy compound. Cabernets tend to have a lot of tannin. I mean, crazy, like your mouth just is sucked up with, uh, it's, it's like it's dry after you take a sip of, of uh, Cabernet. So. This is gonna be more friendly. So one of the places I go with this is if someone is a more of a beginning drinker at one of your tables and they're looking to try a red, uh, they might uh, be interested in something like a Cabernet, but they're kind of new to it. I would put them into a Zinfandel versus putting them straight into a Cabernet because Zinfandel has those really rich, ripe berries that someone might be looking for who's new to red wine, but it's not gonna have the abuse or the grippy compound of, of Cabernet, of all that tannin in your mouth, which tends to be a little off-putting until you get used to it. So that is how it compares to other reds on a wine list. Let's see, other things. Oh, pairings. All right, so, oh, you know what? One more thing about about Zinfandel versus Cabernet. I think of both of these wines like football players. So they're kind of masculine to me, these wines. And Zinfandel is the football player who's big, but super lovable and friendly and everybody's teddy bear. That is what Zinfandel is to me. Well, Cabernet is more like a football player, but they're aggressive. This is an aggressive football player. He might be even a little bit abrasive, maybe bad jokes, you know, maybe a little bit raunchy, 
that is more of Cabernet to me. A little harder to take, not quite the lovable Zinfandel kind of football character. So that's, I do think about football characters when I think about Zin and Cab. So pairings. So I love barbecue um, and I love all kinds of barbecue and it varies by place in the United States as to what they do. So when I think of barbecue, I think of the Kansas City style of barbecue, which tends to be molasses with uh, some tomato sauce. So it's kind of a sweet and tangy sauce. Um, not and, and tomato-y, but not super tangy. When you look into, say, the Car Carolinas, Memphis, they go with a heavy vinegary sauce. So I love the Memphis, uh, excuse me, the, those other kinds, but I eat more of the Kansas City style. So barbecue is great with Zinfandel because it's got that jammy, sweet kind of big fruits that can complement those, that molasses in the barbecue sauce. I also think of, say, pork with a fruit sauce because this doesn't have a lot of tannin in it and you really need tannin for fat in in food. A lot of pork, like tenderloin, for example, is relatively lean. So I do, say, a lean pork tenderloin, but it might have a, a raspberry treatment on it or some kind of a fruit, apple, that kind of thing. This kind of a fruity, fruit-forward wine with low tannin would be great. A, a Zinfandel or a Primitivo. And then also teriyaki beef because it's got that sweet, but it's also got the savory character of beef. So um, that is, those are my go-to, Zinfandel is my go-to wines for a lot of those types of meats that have that titch of sweetness. The only thing that I would say you want to keep Zinfandel away from, especially if it's a California Zinfandel, is super picante foods. Super, not spicy in the sense that they've got nice spices like cinnamon and cardamom and those kinds of things. I'm talking about chili, like capsaicin spice where your mouth is hot and and um, actually feels like it's got fire in it. Because when you put a super hot, hot thing in your mouth and then you add a high alcohol wine, it is like putting a blowtorch on a fire. It literally lights your mouth up with pain. So high alcohol and super spicy as in picante, not, not uh, you know, spices like cinnamon and that, but the, the searing heat, you don't want to put those together. So I'd stay away from a California Zinfandel with say Mexican food that you're putting a lot of heat into or Thai food, that kind of thing. So excited to be here with you today. Next class, we are going to be uh, working with dry wines. So what does that mean? How do you talk about dry? What is the style? And when someone says to you at your table, which I've heard, oh, you know, I really, I really like fruity wines, but, but I don't want any, or I really like dry wines, but I don't want any fruit, no fruit, none of that. It's like, mm, not the same thing. So we'll talk about what dry means and how you can actually figure out how someone, at, what your someone at your table is truly talking about before you bring them something that they will turn away and you'll, you know, you'll be bummed about that service because just a few questions will help you figure out what they're actually truly asking about. Cheers to you. Happy Thursday. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.